is that um, uh, Muhammad, he's kind of excusing him, saying he'd been longing in his heart so badly to reconcile with the Quraysh that when it was time to recite this part of the verse, Satan slipped in to say, well, let's, you know, ho hope these females are exalted and let's, you know, hope for their intercession. And Muhammad went with it, you know, not out of evil intent, but because his heart was so longing to be reconciled. And that night, Gabriel came and upbraided him and said, you were speaking as words of God, words that weren't really from God. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, what we have here, and the people were reading along with it on the screen there, is uh, some, one of the early biographers, a Muslim biographer. Right. And he's, Al he, and he's giving this story himself. So this isn't something a Christian who's trying to attack Islam made up. This mm -hmm. is actually coming from Islamic sources right. giving this story. And they're relating the fact, according to Islam here, the fact that the Islamic prophet Muhammad actually recited words to people that were given to him by the devil. Mm -hmm. And he was content with that. He went along with that. And then he had to be corrected, according to this biographer, by the angel Gabriel later that he had blown it. Right. Blown it big time. Yeah, yeah, and then he grieves about it. But what I have to wonder about is if... This is this is such a significant, significant error because anyone can see or know, and especially someone that's supposed to be a prophet of God, that if there's only God to be worshipped and adored and no one else, to actually recite something in the name of God that actually gives credence to an idea of goddesses, like and, Muhammad and was want, and, and goddesses that you want through intercession. Right. And you want their intercession, and he had knowledge of these names. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like he didn't know who these deities were, these goddess, goddesses were, because he came from the Chorus tribe, as you mentioned, and these were already well known right. in their traditions and in their religion. So this wasn't something he was ignorant of, yet he says it anyway. Mm -hmm. And then he. And, and then he acts like he doesn't know or something when, the, when Gabriel comes and tells him later, like. And he grieves sore. I mean, in a way, just logically thinking it through, there's no way Muhammad could have done this with uh, his his without knowing what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He he went into this thing with his eyes wide open, and yet he still did it, and supposedly got this rebuke from the, this angel. But right. to me, it. It, it it goes beyond belief. It's like any prophet of God, like Abraham or Isaiah or Jeremiah coming along. They're doing all this preaching for God. They're prophets. And then all of a sudden they also say, oh, by the way, we can, uh, you can seek intercession, inter intercession from these, these other gods over here. You know, and it's like a slap in the face to someone like Moses where the Ten Commandments say point blank, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And it even says in like, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. In fact, uh, well, I've already uh, changed the reference here. I had it here earlier. I was reading it earlier. But I think it's around verse 39 where it says, God Himself says, There is no other God with me. And when you go to Isaiah, it, it says, there, there is no other gods. I know not of any. Right. And if God doesn't know of any other gods, well, there aren't any other gods. He knows everything. Right. So this, this, this is a slap in the face to all the other prophets of God. And in Islam, they hold uh, Moses in high esteem, David, uh, these other prophets, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus, and none of them would have done this. Right. But yet Muhammad does it. Right. Now, there is an analog to this. Something similar to this kind of happened uh, outside of Islam. Uh, within Mormonism, the prophet Brigham Young, and, uh, he said that Adam is our God and Father, the only God with whom we have to do. And he said this in the Mormon work, uh, Journal of Discourses, Volume 1, uh, page 50 and 51. So there is, you know, and Brigham Young, Muslims and Christians would agree that he was a false prophet, and he was especially a false prophet, you know, with other gods when, when he said, you know, that Adam was our God and Father. So there is, you know, this isn't the only time in history this, this has happened. 
Right. But 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 certainly we wouldn't. You know, it, that's no recommendation of it. Right. And plus, in your example of Brigham Young and Mormonism, he believes in lots of gods anyway. Right. He right. he was always teaching polytheism, and then in Mormonism, you can become a god yourself anyway. If you do the right if things, you do the yeah. right things. You go through the Mormon temple ceremonies, and you do all your, you know, you don't drink tea or coffee and things of that nature. But so. You can kind of understand in a way why Brigham Young would say such a thing because he's already a polytheist to begin with. But now for Muhammad to say this, when he's proclaiming there's only one God. Monotheism, right. Right, he's, he's proclaiming monotheism. And he's not going around like a Brigham Young and saying, I'm going to become a God and all that kind of stuff. He's proclaiming one God, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he's suddenly talking about these, these goddesses of, uh, of Allah. And talking about seeking their intercession. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really, when you think about it, there's really no excuse for that. Right. And, and because it came from his family background, he grew up with the knowledge of all these things. Like I said before, he did this with, with his eyes wide open. And it's almost incomprehensible for me to think that any prophet of God, when you think of all the biblical prophets of God, like who I mentioned a minute ago, ever doing this. Mm -hmm. And uh, but a false prophet, I can see doing it, like you just mentioned, Brigham Young, right. or other false prophets. You can see them doing that. But if if Muhammad were a true prophet of God, it's almost inconceivable that he would do such a thing. So maybe he wasn't a true prophet of God. Well, that's that? hopefully <laughs> the, the conclusion I was wanting our viewers to come to. All right. Anyway, let's go but, on. Well, before we move on to the next one, a, a couple of things I left out that, that you might want to know is that it said that after he said this, he continued and completed the, the surah. Uh, he closed with, wherefore, bow down before God. Okay, so he didn't just stop there and other parts were passed on later, but he did the whole thing. The other thing to notice is that it said that both the Muslims and the uh, Quraysh, basically everybody there, bowed down uh, to, uh, to basically in respect for the surah. So why would these polytheists bow down unless there was something in it for them? You know, and of course there was this. All right, now of course uh, we have only shown one source, though, and you know, like we said before, that 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 the Muslims, you know, or anyone would tend to trust something more if there was more than one source. In fact, didn't you say? And, and I think you did say in, our, in some of our other shows that we've done on Islam that, like for for instance, uh, Al Bukhari when he was amassing all their hadiths. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make uh, pick, sifting through three hundred thousand hadiths, right. he's trying to get the most authentic. Didn't he have some kind of criteria that said, "Well, there's more witnesses, or there's more corroborating evidence that would lend to the idea that this hadith here is more authentic than they, some they, of the other." They would look at the at the witnesses that 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 pass it down, and they'd uh, and they'd also look at the quality of each passing, like a chain of transmission. You know, if somebody says, I don't know who I heard of this from, then that's not very good quality. But if someone said, I heard it from so-and-so, and they heard it from so-and-so, and they heard it from a companion of the prophet, of course, you can't really ask anybody except the last guy, but assuming he's honest, and assuming the guys before him were honest, then, you know, there would be a higher probability that that would be correct. And so by the very fact of their authoritative hadith and their Islamic religion, that they put a, a lot of trust in. Mm -hmm. It was based on corroborating evidence and more than one witnesses witness saying these things. Right. And that's about exactly what you're doing here, showing these different biographers who are Muslims. Right. And and, and we'll actually get to Bukhari directly in, in, in just a little bit. Okay. Well, the next biographer is Ibn Sa'd. And he died at 845 AD, which is still prior to the collection of the Hadith. Now, he was independent of Wahidi because he wrote his own 15-volume work, Kitab al-Tabakat al-Kabir. However, he really wasn't totally independent because um, he was aware of Wahidi's work. Okay, um, so, But he wrote about this also. All right, the next one. So he, you're saying he basically said the same thing right. as Wahidi. Right. Okay, the next one is kind of interesting because he was actually much earlier. Uh, Ibn Ishaq, and he died in 767 AD. Now, he wrote Sirat Rasulala, 